Late in August 2023, I've put on a sturdy pair of shoes and am daring to venture out on a night walk. The moon is in its first quarter, a slim crescent half shrouded in heavy clouds. Its light is dim, barely visible above the thickly clustering trees in the wood I'm walking through. The atmosphere is close and humid despite the lateness of the hour, and although we can usually see the stars in our part of the world, there's no sign of them tonight. Being out alone at night does something to the imagination. In the absence of daylight, everything seems amplified. It's very easy to imagine that you aren't alone at all, that you're being watched from every minutely rustling bush, from every gnarled tree trunk. Even the sound of your own breath seems unnatural. Can it really only be yourself you hear? Are the steady beats of your footsteps the only footsteps? All too easily, the mind starts to introduce new, sinister characters to the scene. How many of us have walked along imagining that if we stop and turn, a dark figure will be standing on the path behind us? But perhaps it isn't the darkness we ought to fear, but the tantalising promise of a light bobbing just ahead of us almost out of sight. A light means sanctuary, a guide through the darkness, a route back to civilization. Or does it? Today's story is about the things which lurk in the darkness and the lights you shouldn't always trust. So keep your lantern full of oil, stick to the path, and be ready to fall flat on your face if you see something you shouldn't. If you do make it back to safety, gather close around the campfire and listen in. Welcome to the Three Ravens podcast. There were three ravens sat on a tree down a down hey down a down they were as black as they might be with a down one of them said to his mate where shall we our breakfast take with a down dairy 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 down down Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the Three Ravens podcast. Yay! I'm Eleanor Conlon and I'm holding out my ghostly lantern to light your way across a mysterious stretch of Fenland. <laughs> and my co-host Martin Vaux is wading his way towards me out of the darkness. Hello! I don't think I should have worn my trainers. I think I would have been better in my wellies. <laughs> you think you would. <laughs> We're now over halfway through series two. Yeah, we are. We've recently released our newest Dying Arts episode, which is all about vellum and parchment making. Uh-huh. And we'll be back with something wicked later this week. So many murders. So, so many, many murders in this week's episode. <laughs> <laughs> For our Patreon subscribers, we had a great time reviewing the 2022 folk horror film You Won't Be Alone for our Three Ravens Film Club. And we have some new Patreon subscribers to thank George and Jan. I hope it's Jan. It might be Jan, but I think it's Jan. Anyway, all hail George, King of Patreon. All hail Jan, King of Patreon. Thank you both so much for supporting the podcast and thank you to all of our supporters and our subscribers your support makes it possible for us to create extra content and to go on adventures and I guess just make the show in general buy books things like that so we really appreciate it and if you'd like to support the podcast please consider signing up for our Patreon for $3 a month or $6 a month at patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast now we'll talk a bit more about correspondence at the end because it's been a busy week for it but there has been something we must mention this happened this week the Scone Wars. History's most divisive battle. <laughs> now, if you didn't hear it, for our Devon episode last week, we had a lovely cream tea and opened up the cream or jam first discussion on social media. And what can I say? It's an issue people definitely feel strongly about. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone for joining in with us. We had so much fun reading all your comments oh, yeah. and actually feel genuinely informed about clotted cream <laughs> history yeah, too. we do. Three Ravens community, you have the best sense of humour yeah. and we're really grateful to you for sharing it with us. Our main takeaway has been that people enjoy their scones in all sorts of different ways, but no doubt about it, Eleanor, the Devon way was definitely the majority. 
hashtag cream first. And uh, thank you to everyone who identified themselves as being on the right side of history. And I shall continue to enjoy my scones in what I now know is Buckingham Palace style. Thanks very much. <laughs> so, Eleanor, we are releasing this episode on the 28th of August. Is there anything we can celebrate today? Any obscure saints with miracles most peculiar? Well, it is, of course, the rather prosaic August Bank holiday yeah, in course. England, mm. which is something which passes for a widespread traditional custom. Yeah, I guess. Our current system of bank holidays was created relatively recently, actually, in 1871. Oh, really? And I discovered there's actually an Act of Parliament, oh. the Bank Holidays Act. Now, this was basically to ensure that everybody had some time off around their miserable jobs. Yeah, I never realised <laughs> it was an official act, though. I just thought it was generally agreed. Oh, yeah, it's part of like the workers' rights movement, basically. That's great. Yeah. Well, they often conform, as you say, with general common law holidays like Christmas, Easter and New Year's Day, but they occasionally add special ones to celebrate things like royal weddings and jubilees and yeah. all sorts of things like well, that. Well, this one that we're celebrating the day of release is a day that's intended to get everyone to go to the shops in advance of the new school year starting. So it's there for like buying uniforms. So and it stuff. was created for shopping. Yeah, it was created just to try and create <laughs> economic activity, which is weird. Bank holidays feel too mainstream to feature on this podcast. <laughs> well, I have something which I think you'll find infinitely preferable. Ooh. If we visit Malden, which yeah. is a village in Devon today, sure. we can celebrate the Apple Pie Fair. An entire fair devoted to apple pie? This sounds like heaven, well, Eleanor. It does sound rather good. In addition to the usual village fair activities and stalls, they have a giant apple pie. What? The Malden Apple Pie, oh, which is described as being about the size of a kitchen table. <sighs> I mean, I love apple pie, but I'm not sure I could actually finish an apple pie that was the size of a Well, this table. one makes a grand entrance on a cart pulled in by a donkey. <laughs> and the festivities are reigned over by the apple pie princess. Oh, my goodness. Well, darling, you are my apple pie princess. Oh, thanks. <laughs> but she makes the first cut into the pie, yeah. which is then shared by the community. This sounds like an absolutely marvellous festival. I'd love to put apple pie princess on my business card. <laughs> and I hope whoever is crowned with that title does. <laughs> and I also hope she has a crown made of pies. Oh, yeah, of course. Naturally, like a flaky pastry crowd that would be super <laughs> uh, what a great tradition well that's much more interesting than just a regular old bank holiday we're also celebrating the saint's day of saint augustine of hippo now i feel like i'm going to be disappointed by this but is saint augustine anything to do with hippopotamuses he is not the saint of hippopotamuses Boo. but of hippo regius which is a place in modern day algeria <sighs> See, now, we've had dog-headed saints. I'm kind of imagining this saint to be an actual hippo, maybe? I, mean, I think a hippo would look really regal and saintly robe. Yeah. But Augustine of Hippo was actually a really interesting person, oh, not okay. a hippo. Right. He travelled widely and he was incredibly learned, subscribing to a number of different schools of philosophical thought across his life, okay. in addition to his Christian belief. He actually helped to form the doctrine of original sin. Ooh, so he's actually got some bad ideas as well. Well, <laughs> yes. Um, and he's famous for having asked God to grant him chastity and continence, but not yet. What? So he wanted to be incontinent. <laughs> so uh, well, let, me wet, think... let me wet my pants for years. Continence God. meant something a bit different <laughs> when St. Augustine was um, talking about. No, he was famously a, a bit of a lover oh. and um, really liked the ladies okay. and then came to realise that was probably not the best thing, hence uh, the original sin. All right. And he also didn't perform any notable miracles, but he wrote extensively, so perhaps that was the miracle. So he was sainted for just writing loads um, and, and he came up with original sin and he was a bishop and he travelled and preached and converted quite a lot of people <laughs> I'm not impressed St <laughs> Augustine of Hippo you should be a hippo and also continent just as a matter of course <laughs> That's my view. Anyway, happy Saints Day to you, I suppose. But I think Apple Pie Fest will be my celebration of choice today. I pledge allegiance to the Apple Pie Princess, whoever you are. Now pass me that pie cutter. With that, I think it's time to peel the county criers away from their pie-based revels and get them to ring us into Huntingdonshire. Oh, Huntingdonshire is a historic county, but it's now a part of modern Cambridgeshire. The Huntingdonshire area is on the west side of Cambridgeshire, so it was historically bordered by Lincolnshire to the north, Bedfordshire and Northamptonshire to the west, and Cambridgeshire to the east. It was a county until 1974, 
when it merged with Cambridgeshire and the Isle of Ely to become one united Cambridgeshire. And were the people of Huntingdonshire happy about being merged? Apparently not, Ooh. as in the 1990s, a case was made that Huntingdonshire should become its own unitary authority again, mm. which did actually happen in the cases of Rutland and Herefordshire. Tiny, but tiny Rutland. not Huntingdonshire. Oh, no. The commission considering it decided there was, and I'm quoting them here, I don't think this, yeah. no exceptional county allegiance to Huntingdonshire oh, as had burn. been perceived in Rutland and Herefordshire. Oh, dear. It does seem rather unfair. And some residents evidently thought so too, as after it was rejected as a unitary authority, a Huntingdonshire society was created to campaign for its reinstatement as a ceremonial and administrative county. Well, sounds good. And they even established an annual Huntingdonshire day guess when mm, i wouldn't have a clue when, when would they establish a huntington shed day well who's the unofficial third host of the podcast and one of my faves oh is it oliver cromwell is, that, is it his birthday <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my goodness eleanor i think i'm gonna have to get a jar with a picture of cromwell's face on it for you to contribute every time you mention it. i have legitimate cause in this episode oh, yeah. and yeah you are spot on huntington shed <laughs> day is on the 25th of april which is of course the birthday of the one and only oliver cromwell okay and and I'm guessing then that Oliver Cromwell, we, we talked about him in relation to Cambridgeshire. So is he a Huntingdonshire person? He is. Oh, okay. The Huntingdonshire person. Oh, he is the Huntingdonshire. Oh, right. Very well. <laughs> and how is Huntingdonshire Day celebrated? Like, do we ceremonially overthrow the reigning monarch? We don't, but we <laughs> could read the Huntingdonshire Declaration, Ooh. which asserts that it is, in fact, a county. <laughs> or we could visit the mayor, who photographic evidence assures me owns a bright green suit emblazoned with with Huntingdonshire's crest. Cool. And he might give us out a key fob with the same crest on it. Oh, that's nice. And there's also been a campaign amongst local people to add Huntingdonshire to their addresses instead of Cambridgeshire. And I've got to ask, what is the county crest? It is a gold and beribboned hunting horn Ooh. on a bright green field. And the county motto is Labore Omnia Florent by Labour everything prospers. Well, that's true, I think. By Labour, everything does prosper. Yes, and I think this is one of the reasons they chose Cromwell's birthday for Huntingdonshire Day, because he came from a humble background yeah, sure. that demonstrated that a man of Huntingdonshire can rise to the highest. OK, well, Huntingdonshire, we support you in your fight to be recognised as a county again. I guess you had a lot of fun doing the research for this because it feels nice and rebellious <laughs> and kind of bubbly under the surface. We are all for the re-establishment of historic counties. And if we knew anybody who lived there, we would absolutely address Christmas cards to you correctly. Yes. And have you heard of the sport, Bandy? Nope. Well, no, nor had I, but it's a type of game on ice. It's, okay. It seems to be quite similar to ice hockey, right. although bandy aficionados will probably tell me there's a lot of differences. Yeah. And that was originated in Huntingdonshire, possibly as early as 1730. Well, it's got to be its own proper county if it has its own sport. Well, quite. And it does have an awful lot of history to back up its claim, too. Okay. The earliest known English settlers in the area were an East Anglian tribe called the Yeras, who set up shop there in the 6th century. Whoa. The Danes were also very happy to call Huntingdonshire their home from home in the 9th century. Okay. In fact, it was quite an important military centre for them until 915 when Edward the Elder, who was the son of Alfred the Great, the eldest son, funnily enough, <laughs> managed to get it back from the Danes and establish it as a really wealthy area. Oh, I can't believe the Danes just let that one go. Yeah, they didn't. By 1011, <laughs> Huntingdonshire had been overrun again oh, and right. it was captured by Canute. That sounds very Danish, yeah. Yep. Somewhere along the way, it, of course, ended up being part of Mercia. Yay, <laughs> yeah. up, and up. then was detached from Mercia and tacked onto East Anglia okay. until being given to the Earl of Northumberland as a thank you present. What? Until it ended up in the hands of David I of Scotland. Can you imagine just giving someone a whole area of land just as a gift? Yeah, it was an earldom at that point, and it was just, <laughs> yep, yeah, have it. <laughs> With a bow on. Large yeah, bow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it seems as though there's a real history of disputes about who gets to keep and own Huntingdonshire. Which has not gone away. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> England did manage to get the earldom back in 1336, <laughs> but this was not the end of strife by any means. Oh my goodness. Henry II actually destroyed Huntingdon Castle, oh, that back. and King John also had a go at this poor county after the failure of the first Magna Carta. <sighs> uh, you know, the one that he sort of signed and then went, actually no, Baron, yeah. <laughs> that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> and during the Wars of the Roses, Huntingdon was sacked by the Lancastrians. Oh my goodness, it sounds like Huntingdonshire has had a rough ride. Maybe so, but it's not all bad. <sighs> okay, come on then. 
throw your spare change in the Cromwell jar. Now, much as I would love to talk about the Civil War and the New Model Army, I'm going to restrain myself because those things don't specifically have to do with Huntingdonshire. You can do this, Eleanor. You don't have to talk about Oliver Cromwell. We're all rooting for you. Thank you. But the Cromwell family <laughs> is important to the county, so okay. it is no idle waste of my spare change. Oh, all right. Their roots in Huntingdonshire start with Sir Henry Cromwell, who was so keen to be a Cromwell that he actually changed his name from Williams to name himself after Thomas Cromwell who was executed under Henry VIII. I see. And he was his uncle. Oh, right. Um, Sir Henry was a very popular uh, courtier. Mm. Elizabeth I liked him. She knighted him. And she even visited him at his seat in Huntingdonshire. That's Shire, interesting. Um, which was Hinchingbrook House at the time. And we'll meet that later again. Uh-huh. And he also lived at the manor house at Ramsey Abbey, which was this incredibly rich, beautiful abbey. He was supposedly very generous. They, he was known as the Golden Knight. Oh, what and, a great title. Yeah. The Golden Knight. Because he poured loads of money into the area wow. and sort of improved things. Sure. And he was Oliver's granddad. Oh, well, I can imagine Oliver appreciating his granddad. I, I imagine he had a little pocket full of Werther's originals. He was giving them out all the time. <laughs> well, Oliver himself was born in Huntingdon. Right. And he went to Huntingdon Grammar School, where Samuel Pepys also went to school. Oh, that's interesting. they went in the same year. Uh-huh. And he was elected MP for Huntingdonshire, like his granddad, who had also been MP. And he lived in Huntingdon, in St Ives and in Ely. Ooh, so he lived all across the area. But sadly, there's little evidence to suggest he had much further to do with his home county. I see. There is, of course, the mystery of where Cromwell's body ended up. Mm. Although it was supposedly exhumed and posthumously executed. Do you know about this? (laughs) Yes. I mean, the the version of it that I heard was that he was hanged, drawn and quartered after death. So they split his body into parts. Some years later and split his body up. Um, But some sources suggest that the body may have been secretly removed prior to that and buried elsewhere. So the the body that was actually... uh, desecrated wasn't him oh, and some suggest that he may be buried somewhere in Huntingdon well I mean or possibly the site of the Battle of Naseby <laughs> we know from our Cambridgeshire episode that his ghost is supposed to haunt Cambridge well, so yes. yeah so if his body is somewhere in the area <sighs> still they really liked a posthumous trial or execution in the past didn't they they really did I wonder where it comes from the idea that doing anything to a dead body will make a difference. Yeah, our friends at Pontifax will no doubt be able to tell you a lot more about the Cadaver Synod, which is about the same subject. (laughs) Such a great moment in history. (laughs) Yeah. So, are you ready to come with me on a lantern-lit nighttime walk around the places and strange legends of Huntingdonshire? Well, I guess. I'm feeling a little bit spooked out, (laughs) but let's do it. Well, our first port of call is Godmanchester, which is on the site of the Roman town of Durovigatum where there are the remains of a Neolithic temple, which is perfectly aligned to the Beltane sunrise. Oh, that sounds nice. And they think it dates from 2900 BC. Whoa. We might also cross the Chinese Bridge, which was supposedly built without the use of any nails or other fixings. Cool. It was rebuilt in 2010, and the current version does feature nails, so we'll never know how those cunning bridge builders in the past achieved it. So I'm, I'm guessing by the name of the county that Huntingdon must be the most important town in the area? Yeah. Yes, it was the county town when Huntingdonshire was officially a county. Sure. The first mention of it's in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in 921, where it's called Huntingdon, Uh which means the Huntsman's Hill. The Huntsman's Hill, Mm -hmm. that's cool. And I guess hence the hunting horn on the county crest. It's a market town and it's always held a valuable trading position. And there's also a variety of elm tree named the Huntingdon Elm, which was developed nearby. And there are quite a few Huntington ghosts, too. Excellent. Well, we love a spook. Tell me, tell me. Huntington Town Hall is supposedly haunted by a female ghost who's been named Betty by the locals. Betty the ghost. Betty the ghost. (laughs) And people have seen a pink floating orb and a figure appearing at upper windows, which is probably Betty. Yeah. Nuns Bridge over Alconbury Brook is haunted by one of the nuns who once lived at the convent at Hinchingbrook House. Oh, yeah. She is often accompanied by another ghost who apparently looks like a nurse. And there are a few different versions of this story, but it seems to be there was an intriguing love triangle. Ooh. So the nun had a lover who might have been a monk who then murdered both of the oh, women. Oh, that sounds like a good subject for a ghost story. It does, doesn't it? Uh, but you mentioned Hinchingbrook House again. So what's the deal with Hinchingbrook House? 
still a stately home today and they actually run a Halloween kind of horror fest because oh. it's sort of come and experience a, a scare maze in a real haunted house. Excellent. They've uncovered skeletons there and there's a ghostly couple which is sent to haunt the corridors. Ooh. There's also the ghost of a cavalier who haunts a particular room nice. and a ghostly woman floating above a staircase. <sighs> well, I mean, that kind of renders the staircase a little bit irrelevant. <laughs> it does. You it? just float upstairs. <laughs> so let's continue our journey on to Kim Bolton. Uh-huh. You may have heard of Kim Bolton Castle, which was where Catherine of Aragon lived and died after Henry VIII divorced her. I mean, maybe I've read the name, but I can't say I've ever heard well, of it. That was where she was sort of dumped. Um, I see. And uh, I think history makes it out to be a horrible place, but it, it's not a horrible place. No, she it's lived a, in quite a lot of luxury. It's a lovely she? castle. Yeah. And she's very unhappy, but yeah. it, was, it was a pretty, pretty lovely castle. Understandably unhappy. Actually, if we go to Kim Bolton very soon, we'll experience the Statute Fair, which is known locally as the Staty. The Staty? Yeah. Come on, let's down to the Staty. <laughs> it's a fair held every September, which traces its origins back to the 1200s. Whoa. Yeah. We can also take a quick detour to St. Neots, which uh, you may remember from when we celebrated St. Neots Day a few yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, of course. His bones were moved to the Huntingdonshire St. Neots from his home in Cornwall, and the place was named after him then. Well, he's probably not too happy about that either. Then maybe no. he's also spooking around. Yes, he might the well ghost be. Of <laughs> now, we're actually going to have to take a detour round the next place on our lantern tour because you already talked about Uh-oh. it in the Cambridgeshire <laughs> episode. So I was going to take us to Whittlesea Mere. Oh, I'm so sorry. I feel much like an unpaid subscriber to the Huntingdonshire Society here because I feel I need to reclaim Whittlesea Mere for my county. <laughs> and I can prove it's part of my county because I have an ancient rhyme. Okay, it better be good. Glatton Round Hill, Yaxley Stone Mill and Whittlesea Mere are the three great wonders of Huntingdonshire. <sighs> I mean, it's not the best rhyme ever. Totally beside the point. <laughs> I'm also backed up by the Festival of the Whittlesea Straw Bear. Oh, that which, sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it's held in Whittlesea every Plough Tuesday. Yeah. And a performer dressed in a bear costume made of straw, which was traditionally the, the very best straw that the farmers had kept back from their yield to make this costume. Outstanding. I love this idea. Danced around the streets in exchange for <laughs> gifts of money or beer or other nice things. And then they ceremonially burned the bear costume after the festival. Yeah, not, not, not the not, performer. Not the performer. No. No, just, just the costume. <laughs> I love this idea. A bear made of straw dancing around and getting drunk in your town. <laughs> yeah. Every town and every village should have this tradition. Straw bear festival. Should we instate <laughs> the new straw bear festival? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, if you're going to produce a person prancing around in a straw bear suit, I will concede. Thank you. Now we've restored Whittlesea to Huntingdonshire, where it belongs. <laughs> let's head off in the direction of St Ives. Now, as I was going to St Ives, I met a man. And weirdly enough... He had seven wives, and each wife had seven sacks, and each sack had seven cats. Each cat had seven kits, kits, cats, sacks, and wives. How many were going to St. Ives? Well, you might ask. <laughs> Martin has just recited the popular riddle about St. Ives, yep. which you probably heard. There's actually a controversy attached as to whether it refers to St. Ives in Huntingdonshire or the one in Cornwall. Mm. And I don't claim to know the answer, but I do know there's a pub on the road into Huntingdonshire, St. Ives, called the Seven Wives. Oh, well, I feel like that cinches it. Yes, we'll go with it. (laughs) St. Ives definitely does have points of interest which aren't to do with that well-known rhyme. It has a bridge which is very unusual because it incorporates a chapel. That's I read unusual. that there are only four of these in the whole of England. Oh, cool. But much like poor Huntingdonshire, the chapel has changed hands quite a lot. Right. After the dissolution of the monasteries, the prior actually lived in the chapel. He was sure. given it as his house. Yeah. But it was also later a doctor's surgery and a pub called Little Hell. Little Hell? It had a very bad reputation. <laughs> <laughs> St Ives also has one of the four statues of Oliver Cromwell that are actually on display in and England. And, of course, the other three are in our front guard. Don't tempt me. (laughs) (laughs) Interestingly, the word tawdry, which means cheap or low quality, supposedly originates from St. Ives from the cloth market held in St. Audrey's Lane, which sold inferior wool and other fabrics at very cheap prices. St. Audrey's tawdry. Yeah, St. Audrey's Lane. That's interesting. Well, at least we know where the seven wives were headed as soon as they got to St. Ives. Yes, get some cheap cloth. (laughs) (laughs) You could have enough Primark in its day. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, tawdry. <laughs> <laughs> the next stop on our tour has to be Hemingford Grey, which is a beautiful Norman Manor house, famous for being home to Lucy Boston, the author of the Children of Green No stories. Have you read any of those? No, I've never read any of the Children of Green No. I haven't either, but it looks like a beautiful place. And it was numbered among the properties of Cromwell's rich granddad. Oh, nice, with his, with his originals. <laughs> yeah, I would like to read those books, actually. They look very magical. Yeah, they're very folky, aren't they? Mm, I think so. Mm. Now, if you've been enjoying this voyage around the fens of Huntingdonshire, then you're not the only one. Have you ever come across Lord Orford's Voyage Around the Fens? I can't say I have, to be honest with you. So in 1774, this character, George Walpole, the third Earl of Orford, not anything to do with the Orford in Suffolk, right? the title, he mustered what can only really be called an armada of converted Fenland lighters, which are a type of quite low-down river barge, (laughs) on a pleasure cruise through the fence. This guy sounds mental and I love it. He gave all of his little boats really grandiose names. So he had the shark, the alligator, the chimera, the coconut victula, (laughs) and my personal favourite, the fireaway bum catch. What? Which seems to have been a punt with a gun stuck on it. No way, he had a gun on his tiny little boat. A gun on a river barge, yeah. yeah. (laughs) A big, long gun. This voyage basically seems to have involved eating and drinking, ogling women and throwing parties, and was a lovely 22-day trip. Wow. But he did write a log, he wrote a sort of captain's diary no. of, of the adventure oh. so we know pretty much what he did on every stage of the journey I mean if they hadn't drained the fens then this would be something I would be seeking to recreate in the future <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly holiday goals yeah. it's not really folklore but it is such a charming and eccentric thing that I, I wanted to include it yeah George Walpole is making his own legend there isn't he <laughs> yeah well a legend even more convergent with our tastes is that of the War Boys Witches Ooh. a very high profile witch trial in the 1590s which connects with the Cromwells once again. Oh, I'm always interested by a witch trial so what was yeah, the deal this here? it's really interesting. So the nine-year-old daughter of the Squire of Warboys started suffering from fits Okay. And she accused one of the household servants, Alice Samuel, who was 76 years old at the time. Uh, so that was very old for the time. Yeah. Then Jane's four sisters and some of the household servants also started to experience fits mm. and make the same accusations, pointing mm. the finger at Alice Samuel. Oh, dear. The Cromwells come into it because the squire was close friends with Sir Henry Cromwell, the Golden Knight. Yeah. And his wife, the then Lady Cromwell, came to visit the family at Warboys and she interviewed Alice Samuel trying to find out you know, if she was a witch and apparently during the conversation Lady Cromwell grabbed some scissors cut off a lock of Alice's hair and told them to burn it which was a folk remedy believed to weaken a witch's power um, but Lady Cromwell was tormented with nightmares and soon afterwards became ill and died what? which was enough evidence for poor Alice Samuel to be arrested put on trial with her whole family oh no her family was arrested as well and hanged oh my so what do you make of that God, that's horrendous I mean I've got to say like a whole family getting ill isn't a huge surprise. Like, if you're all together, you're likely to catch the same illness. But it illness. feels like a little bit of a crucible-like hysteria thing yeah, to it me. Does, doesn't it? The other daughters starting to have fits. And apparently they all sort of started screaming as soon as she came into a room with them and pointing at her and saying they couldn't be in a room with her and she oh. was a witch and stuff. And they didn't like her because she was sat sat rocking by the fire wearing a black cap. Oh, come on. Anyway, she's just a very old lady. Yeah. Um, Imagine being 76 and being basically harassed and bullied by a load of rich kids. Yeah, Ugh. not very nice. And then having your hair cut and And burned. apparently she said to Lady Cromwell, I've never done you any harm yet, but the prosecution pounced on the yet. Ah. Oh. And that was enough. Poor old Alice. Yeah, I do have that to sucks. rather sorry for her, yeah. actually. Aww. Or maybe she's haunting them. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> now, you talked about some sightings of a black shuck-like dog in the Fen area yes, in yes. the Cambridgeshire episode. But 
I found some which link that fenshuk specifically to women, Ooh. especially single women living alone, oh. of course. These women were suspected of being able to transform into large dogs or wolves. Okay. There's also reports of a fen tiger, Ooh. first sighted in 1982. Okay. So a rather more modern <laughs> yeah, beast. very modern. Um, it doesn't look anything like a tiger. There are some photos of it. It's actually a black panther-like creature. Ooh, well, I'll see if I can find those pictures and put them on the blog. Yeah, uh, there's a rather tragic story associated with the fen tiger. Yeah. Is that apparently a sighting of it caused 12 baby rabbits to die of fright. <laughs> I mean, I know that's kind of tragic, but it's also hilarious. You imagine them all simultaneously turning and going, Oh no! And then <laughs> keeling just keeling over. over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, the fen tiger was probably a bit taken aback. Well, probably just went om nom nom at that point. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, you touched on this in your Cambridgeshire episode because of the shared boundaries. Yeah. And also the fact that Cambridgeshire has claimed Huntingdonshire, <laughs> I think, unfairly. It up like but a tiger. The, the Fenland around Huntingdonshire certainly has its own unique mythology. Ooh. Before the fens were drained, they were dangerous and mysterious, swathed in mist, hidden pitfalls, and it was believed that all sorts of evil creatures lived in the bogs, yeah, waiting a, to lure the unwary to their deaths. It's a classic from all around England, isn't it? The idea of creatures in the bogs. Marsh yep. demons of Iken, we've talked about yep, briefly. Exactly. And then there's a load from up north as well. So, yeah. But if you have got to travel through the fens, don't worry, superstition as ever has you covered. Excellent, good. So what do I need to do to protect myself from the creatures of the marshes? You need to carry a small Hessian bag called a safe keep with you. Uh-huh. Traditionally, they contain a rabbit's whisker, right. a hedgehog's nose, what? and the slime of an eel. Ugh. But you could put anything you liked in, whatever oh. felt right to protect you. Okay, all right. So some suntan lotion, my sunglasses, yeah. and maybe a Bug cardigan. spray. <laughs> A massive safe keep. Yeah, well, <laughs> you meant to wear it around your neck. Oh, well, can I not put it on my back? Do I need yeah, to... you probably. I think it's just a rucksack. Yeah, exactly. Point. That's become my rucksack. Yep. So now we know what to do as we venture into the dark. I'll start spinning my yarn right after this. <laughs> Have you ever walked across the fens at night? If it weren't so dark, you'd see for miles and miles. For the land is as flat as a disappointed lover. It was made flat, you see, so that you could never hide. Someone will always see what you're doing. You're never alone in the fens, for we are here. You might have seen our dancing lights hovering above the black stagnant water. Their reflections make them seem near then far away. The darkness and the stench of the marsh gas will so disorientate you that you won't know whether the lights are before or behind you until it's too late. Some call us Boggart, some Willow the Wisp, some simply the Lantern Men. There are other things here too, the night shades, the slithering dark eels, the dead hands which thrust from the water and grab, grab, grab. But we are the oldest. We've been here since this twisted mess of a world was made and then discarded. And we've had a powerful hunger ever since. We all have different methods. But I like the old way, the simple way. Use my lantern to guide the lonely traveller into a treacherous patch till they stick fast in the mud and it pulls them down, 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 drowning them slowly. The black foulness of swamp mud forcing its way into their noses and throats. And then I consume them savouring every last delicious moment of horror and regret. We do not haunt the fens, we are the fens. We are the damp, rich scent of the place, the mists escaping the mirrors, 
Night after night I seek flesh and bone through the reeds and sedge. We are the darkest of the darkness, except for the warm, almost comforting glow of our bright lanterns. You'd never see one of us, even if you came close enough. We caught the moon once, and we would have kept her too if we hadn't been tricked. How we laughed when we trapped her in a mirror and plunged her down under the water, slapping wet mud over her bright shiny hair. I danced myself on the heavy stone we used to weigh her down. She got away from us, and now she shines as bright as she can over these fens to take her revenge on us and keep wanderers safe. Our prey are always trying to trick us. They know no other defence, so they seek to outwit us with cunning. They have their little ways, things they do thinking to protect themselves from us. Whistling is one. If two are travelling together, they split apart a little way, leaving a wide enough gap between them that it seems as though they aren't together at all. Then one will whistle, drawing the lantern man in his direction, but just as our bobbing lights get close, the other whistles, drawing us away and back to him, and so on and so on until they've reached safe ground. Of course, we're wise to that now. Our lanterns have shutters, and we can split up too. Even more pathetic is the way they clutch their little safe key bags, which are supposed to scare us away. Packed with sad relics, eel slime, bits of dismembered wood creature. What's that supposed to do other than add a little sauce to the dish? And they think that lying face down on the ground, mouth in the mud to stifle any noise will see us off too. If I come across someone lying in the mud, I don't go in the opposite direction. I close in and enjoy the splendid meal laid out before me. Oh yes, we know all the tricks. Aside from the moon, there's only one man who ever got away from me. The lying down trick did work for him. For he kept so silent that I passed by without either seeing or hearing him. I didn't have an inkling there was anyone there but me, till I'd gone some distance past him. Well, he scampered back to his farm, and I wasn't quick enough to catch him. His farm was at the edge of the marshes, you see, and I saw there was a horn tied to a pole outside. Was that supposed to scare me away? Or the birds? Either way, it was ridiculous, and I burned it to scorched black scraps with my light, so he'd see it and know to stay off the marsh. I won't be deprived of my dinner twice. Usually, it's very easy, like the one I've just eaten. He thought to bring a dog to protect him, as if a dog would do anything against the Phantom of the Marshes. Stupid creatures. Tasty, though you don't mind the hair sticking in your teeth. Of course it raced away from him, and of course he whistled for it to come back. He whistled, I answered. Man and dog I took pleasure in drowning, and man and dog I ate in wet gobbets and sucked the marrow of their bones. Another missing person lost to the marshes lost to the misty delirium of this place. I please myself, you see, toying with life as I like. Humanity doesn't like to play with its food, but we lantern men are bound by no such rules. Food tastes all the sweeter once it's muddled and mixed up and turned all around. Sometimes, once in a while, when that cursed moon is sleeping and our sky is as dark as our ground mists, I'll choose to let one go. 
but only sometimes, if my hunger is already sated. And sometimes, what happens next is sweeter. I'll tell you a tale of one, if you'll follow my light just a little way. It was a night much like this one. The moon was playing coy, just a sliver of her peeping out from behind a cloud. Show yourself again, I urged her. Come down here and show yourself in all your shininess and I'll have you this time and I'll bury you where nobody will ever find you. I heard them before I saw them, footsteps sloshing thick in the marsh mud. A young couple, exchanging words. His voice was brusque and rough, and he answered her questions abruptly, as if he would cut off her speech. Hers was hopeful, piping, chattering to him about all manner of things. When they hove into my view, she was clinging to his arm, worried about the dark. He was a huge brute of a man, and she a tiny little fairy with an ugly face. She was twittering to him about starting a new life together somewhere, and he told her that they would. I could hear the lie in his voice, smelt in his sweat. Something I like about humans. They trick each other the way they like to trick the lantern men, and so his lying words caught my interest. I like my food to have a little spice after all. So I delayed flicking open the dark panel of my lantern, though my long, shriveled fingers were itching for it. My hand doesn't look like yours, as I live in the dank marsh water. We're always wet, and our skin wrinkles and bloats like the flesh of the drowned. She told him that she was scared of the dark, and he told her he would look after her, and something in the way he said it let me know that he did not mean it. And so I waited, for I wanted to see how it would all play out. He suggested they sit down and rest, and he gave her some bread from his pack. Good, soft, white bread which shone palely against the dark night. She took it gratefully and seated herself carefully on the verge despite the darkness as though they were having a lovely picnic. He stayed standing and when her mouth was stuffed full of that fluffy white bread and she wasn't twittering anymore, he grunted out, Now I will be the death of you. Oh, it was sweet to watch as he choked her with his fingers and thumbs and when he was finished and she lay still, he untied her garter from her leg and tied it tight around her neck just to be sure. The half-chewed bread spilled from her blue-tinged lips and her eyes started out as though somebody had pinched her. Now I was enjoying this so very much and thinking how good they both would taste so full and rich in fear and sin and murder, when I heard a little sound in the reeds, not far from me, a tiny noise like a gasp, and I had almost missed it. A girl, yellow hair, bright and sweet, must have been making her way across the marshes too. She had a little light of her own, which was foolish as anything. As soon as one of my kin saw that, she'd be doomed. She was just the sort I liked to eat, too. But I paused for a moment. She was crouching down, hiding, and looking at the man dragging the body of his girl into the reed beds. And I thought, there's more trouble to be had here than I can cause. You see... We like trouble, we lantern men, we like chaos, we like the swirling of thunderclouds and the ringing of alarm bells and the screams and swoons of the fearful pointing fingers of accusation, the slam windows, and we'll cause it any way we can, even at our own expense. I could see that she would go and inform on him, I could smell the goodness in her, shining brighter than the weak light of her little lantern. 
Sure enough, when the murderer had dumped his girl's body and made his way off through the marsh, she gave herself a shake and she said a prayer. Well, I stuck my fingers into the sticky grey wax in my ears when she did that, for I hate the words of prayers and the sounds of hymns more than I hate the moon. And she said to herself out loud, right there in the marshes, with no regard for who might be listening, Susanna Bird, you do the right thing now by that poor girl. And I knew she meant to get that man caught. But it was with great regret I let her go. For a girl like that, the yellow hair, great handfuls of it like that damn moon, it's just the kind I like to drag into my pool and devour. But sometimes there's more fun to be had when you leave things be. And I haven't got to the age I have without learning that a long existence craves variety. I was not disappointed when I made my way along the waterways at night, following the scent of the yellow-haired girl to find out the result of my selfless act. All the way to the waters of Granter I went, through the roaming ground of the night shack, and to Cambridge, where his trial was being heard. I wasn't in the court, of course, but I heard enough of the gossip from lurking under the town's many bridges, and from my kin who cluster there, flocking like carrion birds to death and tragedy. His name was Thomas Weems, my murderer, and the girl he'd strangled was his wife, Mary Ann. A naughty boy had a second wife he liked better, who didn't have an ugly face, and he wanted to get rid of the first. And she tricked him too. She was no angel, make no mistake. Making a play for him when she'd been just a girl and telling him her womb was swollen with a baby when it wasn't. Humans are so delicious. Susanna Bird, all glowing with the light of righteousness, testified about what she'd seen in the marshes that night. I could have done too, of course. But nobody asked me. It all came out in the trial and the questioning, and Thomas Weems was sentenced to death. And oh, the things they did to him. It was beyond even my imagining. Acid and electricity and steel plates, a thousand jolts and volts. What a flavour his corpse would have if I could get my hands on it now. What was left of it, of course, for it was dismembered in a public gallery for anyone who cared to watch. I heard from listening under a bridge that a piece of his skin was kept and stretched out to cover a book which was tucked into one of their grand libraries. Someone in that university must have a lantern man's sense of humour. My only regret in the whole affair was that I let Susanna Bird go. But if I had not, nothing would have played out quite so wonderfully, and I would have soon forgotten her. As it is, I can't get her out of my wrinkled, curious mind. But perhaps she'll come back across the marshes one day. After all, with Weems dead, she'll think the danger passed and that only human men are lurking in the darkness to squeeze their hands around her throat. But I can wait. When the time comes, I'll beam my light out so bright, so enticing, she'll be drawn towards it like a summer bug to a flame. And then, in her last moments, she will fear the Lantern Man. So, Martin, would you step into the fens of historic Huntingdonshire on a moonless night? Uh, I would not, because I am not an idiot. <laughs> yeah, it does seem to be one of those sort of horror movie things, doesn't it? Where people <laughs> were definitely warned about the Lantern Men, but crossed the fens anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think those stories exist for good reasons. Like, <laughs> don't go into marshy bogland at night. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I really loved his hostility towards the moon. His <laughs> hatred of the moon. I'm going to catch you, moon. I'm going to catch you. I loved it. Well, that was that's, that's based on another sort of 
faintly local. I think the the original actually comes from Lincolnshire folktale about uh, bog creatures trying to capture the moon. Really? Yeah. So it included that little um, idea from another folk story. Well, there's actually quite a few folk tales about the moon being captured or eaten by fish and so on and so forth. So yes. I think in the Irish tradition, salmon eats uh, the moon at, some, at one point and, and gets wisdom yeah, from that. Yeah, and it stands to reason that sort of creatures that thrive on darkness would yeah. want to get rid of the moon in yeah, whatever way they could. Definitely. And what about these Weems people? This this sounds like a real story. Yeah, it was. It was another local story, a Huntingdonshire tale. Ooh. So Thomas and Mary Ann Weems, uh, real people, and it happened more or less as I included it, except that it took place on the road to Royston and okay. not in the marshes, sure. but otherwise pretty much the same. <sighs> and they also really did experiment on his dead body and try to animate it with electricity. Yeah, see, now that felt a little bit like Galvani, a little yeah. bit like it's sort of related to you know, one of my favourite novels, Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, great Brilliant, wonderful. I mean, are, are the two, do they work timeline-wise? Yes. So you would think that um, the events of Thomas Weems's execution and scientific experiments might have inspired Mary Shelley yeah. to write Frankenstein, but rather horrendously, it's the other way round. No way! Yeah. It seems likely that what happened to Weems's body might have actually been inspired by Frankenstein, oh. as it was published the year before his execution and the experiment. That is so yeah. interesting. And did they actually turn his skin into a book? Yep, <laughs> they did. They they did. There's there's a bit of a tradition about doing that to uh, murderers yeah. who've been executed. Actually, there's that book in Moishes Hall in Bury St Edmunds, yes, um, which has the the flayed skin of the the Red Barn murderer whose name temporarily escapes me. But yeah. I think um, it's sort of got a. a preserved ear yeah it does it. i mean spoilers alert but i'm going to for next month something wicked do the red barn murders. oh fantastic so, yeah. we we'll look forward to hearing more about the the preserved ear then yeah i think it also inspired the the book of the the dead in the evil dead yeah movies. of course that would yeah. make sense yep. <laughs> i've seen it it's uh it's disgusting yeah of course naturally <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and you can actually still see marianne williams's grave in godmanchester today really? yeah and it's got this chilling gravestone Ooh, so apparently it? after her murder the parishioners decided that what had happened to her was somehow her fault. What? Yeah, so on her stone, um, it's carved, Air crime you perpetrate, survey this stone. Learn hence the god of justice sleeps not on his throne, but marks the sinner with unerring eye. The suffering victim hears and makes the guilty die. Whoa, poetry of doom. <laughs> yeah, so whoever commissioned the grave was putting the blame on Mary for having slept with Thomas in the first place and pretended to be pregnant to trap him into this marriage, which he didn't want. That and, is uh, dark. So, yeah, it's her fault. That is really, really <laughs> right. dark. It's oh, dark. God, yeah. You can still see it in, I think it's St. Nicholas Church in Godmanchester. Blimey. To this Again? very day. I will find a picture. I will put it on blog. Mm. <laughs> so let's talk correspondence. Oh, yes. Have we heard the flap of dark wings from our community this week? We certainly have. It's actually been a really busy week. Now, the first thing to say is we had our first not-so-positive review this week. Oh, no. Yep. So we went six months or so with only five-star reviews. Which is a very nice streak. Very nice indeed. But iTunes user Ten Leg Pork Chop left us a two-starer saying... I really wanted to like this podcast, but the folklore and history is well researched with a nice element of superstition thrown in, enough to satisfy those beginning to explore the heritage of the UK as well as seasoned travellers. So far, so nice, I think. Yes, so lovely. Yeah, then he says, unfortunately, I find the disingenuous giggling between the presenters extremely irritating. Just tell the stories and drop the false humour, please. Oh, that's a shame. Um, just to reassure our listeners, our, we do laugh a lot on the podcast, <laughs> but um, it's it's totally not disingenuous. We do find each other funny and we have such a great time yeah, recording the we, episode. We really do. Um, but of course, you know... It's not for everybody. No, it's not for everybody. And of course, we absolutely want to hear what people think about the podcast. And thank you, Ten Leg Pork Chop, for taking the time to write us a review nonetheless. Yes, and thank you. We're glad that at least you could see some positive qualities in the podcast. Yes. <laughs> and we, as we say every week, if you haven't already and you do have five minutes, please do swing by Apple Podcasts or iTunes and write us a review or pop some stars on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Yes, please. And um, I suppose the main message there is if you don't want slightly cheesy jokes and just enjoying the the fun and eccentric side of folklore, then 
Maybe it's not the podcast for you. <laughs> Maybe not. But thankfully, there are lots of people out there who really appreciate our cheesy jokes. Not least Sam, who emailed us via three ravens podcast at gmail.com to say, still loving the podcast. You've kept me sane through the six week holidays. We did go to Ruthen in North Wales for a few days. Ruthen Castle is amazing. Free too. Many tales of the grey lady in picture frames all around. Ooh, Interesting to read. Love a grey lady. Yeah. Sam continues, uh, we walked around in hope of a glimpse but alas saw nothing probably as it was daytime and my teenage son Gabe clomped with massive trainers throughout the corridors <laughs> I think even the grey lady would be scared off what a great image <laughs> also Devil's Gorge nearby in loggerheads was absolutely fantastic after all that walking a crafty day was needed we came up with this with acrylic paints and spare roof tiles and Sam sent us some amazing photos of the roof tiles her family painted for her garden saying don't whistle till you're out of the woods I know it's so cool and so nice so um, lovely. Sam then ended her message saying keep telling fantastic stories I love the accents and have spread the love to all my friends oh that's so nice thank you Sam thank you Sam we also had a lovely message from Alicia who wrote to us to say hello Eleanor and Martin I wanted to share with you that I I'm in the Cater Howe School of Folklore and we're doing an Add Magic to Your Life challenge this week. When asked what enchanting thing we've read recently, I mentioned your podcast. I think and hope that you will have many new listeners soon. <laughs> we need to therefore gronk out a hearty Three Ravens welcome to everyone from Cater Hall School of Folklore who's now listening to the podcast. And thank you so much, Alicia, for spreading the word. We really, really appreciate it. Similarly, we heard from Joan via Facebook who wrote, I let the members on the Detectorist series group know about you. I enjoyed the first episode so much, just had to share. So hello also to everyone on the Detectorist series hello. group who's taken the time to listen in. We love that series, yeah. probably quite predictably. Yep. And thank you especially to Joan for sharing the podcast and for all your lovely comments this week. Welcome to the Three Ravens Conspiracy. We also heard from Instagram user The Amelioration, who said in response to our Westmoreland episode, just listening to this one, wanted to add another weird Thomas the Tank fact. I told you he was a folkloric figure. My husband <laughs> is from Walney Island. The bridge from mainland Barrow over to Walney is the Vickerstown Bridge. Ah, yeah. Thomas is crucial to Westmoreland. I'm slightly I think. afraid that he might be loose, though. <laughs> <laughs> Over the bridge. Yep. We should also say a big thank you to our likers, commenters, and super sharers this week, including B, Rachel, Adrian, Anya, Clark, Andy, David, and Rebecca on Facebook, RTRT Liza, Nick Riddle66, David and Sarah GP, and oh, I hope I'm saying this right, Amish and Dragon on Instagram. And Galeria Stewart, the ever supportive Trillia, and the Stories of Scotland podcast on Twitter. Oh, yes, if you'd like some Scottish folklore in your life. Uh, and to learn a lot more about Scottish geology than we ever thought there was yes, to know. so interesting. Then do check out the Stories of Scotland podcast. They're like cousins from across the border we never knew we had. Yes. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who's interacted with us online, especially in the Great Scone Wars, <laughs> and to our patrons once again. To find all our Patreon exclusive content, just head to patreon.com forward slash Three Ravens podcast. And connect with us on social media via facebook.com forward slash Three Ravens podcast, Instagram at Three Ravens podcast, and Twitter at Three Ravens Pod. Are we still doing threads? Uh, I've been really lazy about threads. It's because you can't schedule posts. You have to do it all from your mobile phone. You can't you do must it from be desktop. Threaded. Yeah, live. always <laughs> constantly on it. And I don't know. I don't have the time. <laughs> so, Martin, where will we be wandering to next week? We are wandering to Berkshire to explore the legend of the mysterious Hearn the Hunter. Oh, as my only knowledge of Hearn the Hunter comes from Shakespeare's *The Merry Wives of Windsor*, I'm place. looking forward to finding out the truth. <laughs> so, while our lantern men have sidled off into the darkness that way. We'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle until you're out of the woods. Thanks and credit go to Legends of the Fenland People by Christopher Marlowe, the Huntingdonshire Society's page on the Association of British Counties website, the Ely Museum website, and A History of Huntingdonshire by Michael Wicks. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our logo was designed by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks and such lean man With a down, derry, 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 down, down